So yeah, today I will talk about uh, rethinking reinforcement for 3D printing mortar. So I'm part of a uh, SICA company, so I will, I will introduce, address, introduce it to you later on. But first I would like to make a brief introduction about 3D printing. Um, so what is 3D printing? This is to bring uh, functionality to the matters by changing the shape of an object. So it's already uh, widely used in a lot of different uh, domains, uh, such as aeronautic, automotive, production, uh, medical, food, art, etc., etc., for for years now. But in in construction, in concrete, in general, it took a bit of year before it kicked in. But now it's very it's very hot topic, and I'm very glad to be here today to to discuss it with you. Um, because concrete and construction in general, it's always a bit the latest to make uh, to make like technology step and a uh, huge improvement. If you look at those two pictures here, it's very hard to believe that there is 100 years difference between two. It looks roughly the same, except the second picture is in color, because the technique and the method are, are roughly the same. Even obviously there is a lot of different improvement. One very very good improvement though, it's obviously the safety. If you look at this video of uh, uh, like 100 years ago, it was super dangerous. At least now the workers are, are, sa are way safer. There are obviously a lot of improvement in construction and concrete science in general, but they are not really revolutions. They are more uh, incremental and small step in one direction. Uh, here, for example, it's a picture of, um, of precast elements which are assembling together in order to make a new building. But actually, this is already a technique which has been used already a lot, a long time ago. Here, it's a picture from the from the 20s, uh, I believe, in San Antonio. So it's been it's been it's been a while already that uh, those kind of techniques happen. So I'm very glad to be here today to to be part of this possible revolution in construction and in concrete science. So short history of 3D printing. Uh, so for us, at least in uh, in our company, the really the so a really big point about 3D printing is this building built in China by Vincent Company in 2014, where they 3D print a wall building with concrete. So as a major step point, um, if you think about 3D printing in general with a computer which assists a robot in order to build an object, it's more towards the 80. Uh, but actually, com uh, actually in concrete, it's already happened a long time ago. There is this guy in this garden who actually 3D print a little. Uh, uh, a little element here. Uh, so obviously it's very slow. It's probably not a very high performance concrete, but actually he did it. He did it by himself, and I, I think it's 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 pretty it's pretty impressive. Uh, here I will I will let the video a little bit, but yeah. So he's feeling the concrete. You have a, like some kind of a little robot going on. Uh, but I guess uh, I I find it actually a pretty cool a pretty cool movie. Then if you come back uh, really in the early ages of uh, humanity, you will think about pottery, some kind of 3D printing as well, because you have a materials that you shape with uh, a different tool in order to create a unique tools with unique properties. So for us, at least for me, it's everything is, uh, oops, and here, I will shut down the sound here of this video. But uh, yeah, there is a lot of different stuff improving. So why Sika is interesting by 3D printing uh, of concrete in general? So Sika will make a brief present presentation. So it's a Swiss company. We are based in Zurich for the headquarter, but we are uh, we are there all around the world in more than 150 countries. Uh, we have seven big uh, target markets, which are concrete, waterproofing, roofing, flooring, seeding and bonding, refurbishment and industry. And in my in my team, uh, in the research and development team, we're working in a strong collaboration with those six uh, six target markets. And they are all very interested by 3D printing in general, not only for concrete, but also for polymers, uh, plastic, or also like glue and adhesives that we are also uh, manufacturing within Sika. But today I will more focus on the 3D printing part. So for us, everything started uh, in the laboratory. Actually, um, uh, here it's a uh, shut on the sound. Actually, uh, here this is like a, um, this is what happening in our lab. Here uh, we make some little object there, and uh, we were able afterwards to. Uh, to upscale everything here. So we start very small here. The size is about 
5 to 10 centimeters. It was very small. It's also cementitious materials. This is a cement paste. And there we are able to, uh, to upscale everything. Here. Here. So here we, we, we are able to 3D print like very big objects actually. And, um, oops, sorry. And uh, yeah, so here you see like different sides of the object. We can print in color. Um, yeah, we can print different kind of object. Here is this is a column. Here we can also tune the color on demand. Uh, so green and normal color of the concrete. We can also here print some acoustic elements uh, where we can play with the shape to have different uh, properties for the materials. And yeah, and that's that's pretty much it. So we start in the lab and then we upscale it to the real application, to the real 3D printing laboratory. Um, so how is it going for us? So we are, everything is automatized. So from the mixing here on the left, you have our continuous mixer, which produces constantly uh, concrete. So here you can see it's a very, very fluid concrete that we can pump. And then afterwards, we are printing those kind of object right now. So here you can see it's very hard. Uh, it's very difficult to break. There is no fibers yet, no reinforcement. It's just very high performance concrete. And as you can see here, um, um, it will manage to break it actually um, without with a lot of problem, and actually you can see that the cracks is totally randomized. So that means that there is a good adhesion between uh, layers, which is something which is a very, uh, very important in the case of uh, of reinforcement and of study printing in general, because people are really afraid of a very weak uh, interbonding layer. But this is not what we what we get in our case if you if you if you are able to to control a bit the, the materials. Um, so today we, we see a lot of different techniques from our colleague before, like very complicated and promising techniques. But today I will more uh, discuss about something maybe more uh, down to earth, maybe something a bit more industrial, which is the use of uh, fibers uh, directly used, directly put in the concrete. Um, so concrete is the most used uh, construction material in the world. Uh, it has very high compressive strength, up to 100 megapascals. But compared to the compressive strength, it has a rather weak flexural properties. So that's why this weakness is generally overcome by the use of metallic reinforcement. But if you think about globally about 3D printing, one of the main advantages, uh, at least according to us, of 3D printing is the um, freedom of design. It's the time you save by designing the object on your computer and directly printing it. And if you are thinking globally and that you have to add afterwards some rebars or to add afterwards some reinforcement or before or after, it could make the whole process uh, very long and very difficult to handle. And then at the end, um, if you think globally about the business part of it, then you will lose a lot of the advantages of the 3D, which is this freedom, this fast production of elements. And so that's why we are thinking more about to use uh, alternative reinforcements such as fibers. Fibers are already used uh, nowadays. Here's this beautiful uh, facade of the museum in, in Marseille in France. And so it's already possible to use it as reinforcements. It's obviously not as strong as rebars. It obviously have a lot of weakness, but this is a part of the work that I will show you today that um, you, it is possible to use fibers uh, as a reinforcement for 3D printing. Um, so why do we need that? Actually, it's because in 3D printing, uh, it's very challenging to use fibers directly because the geology of the concrete has to be carefully controlled here. I show you a quick video there of uh, one of the printings that we're we done, that the, picture, the video is an interview if you wish, and see that the product has to be extruded uh, on a pipe, which could be very long. Ours is about 50 meters. So you need to very you need to be able to very carefully control the the rheology of it, and as you may know, if you add fibers into your concrete into your mortar, you will uh, you will increase its viscosity, its yield stress. So you have to really carefully control the amount of fibers and how it impacts your rheology and your pumpability of your mortar. So at the same time, we need to understand the impact on the fiber on the rheological properties and also to, to find if there are any optimum for the fiber concentration because you, you want to use like the good amounts, the ones that bring the properties but doesn't destroy too much your rheology. Um, first question is how to measure fiber efficiency first. 
Um, so in our case, we use three-point flexion test. Um, so we did very simple tests. We cast uh, four for 16, uh, so centimeters, um, with different fiber concentration, and we break them in order to measure different properties. First is the uh, F max, which is the force maximum where the first cracks happen here. But also another point which is interesting, it's all this energy which is stuck here. This is the area below the curve. And this is the resistance to crack of opening. And this is very important, mainly for safety. First, for the safety of your pieces that you're 2D printing. But also if you just think about transport, because most of the place, you want to 3D print your elements at, a, at one place and then transport it locally. And if you want to be able to transport it safely without breaking any single pieces that you are 3D printing, then you need to reinforce them in a way to another. And this resistance to cracks, this resistance to this improving flexural strength to the concrete will help a lot for the transport and the safety of it. There's a little diff different family of fibers. I will go very uh, shortly through, but there's a different, a lot of different materials, different four factor, etc. And uh, for us, if you want to very summarize, there is two main family of fibers, which are the one which improves the maximum force to break your prism here, and also one which improves the energy, which increases the energy stock by your samples, the energy you need to, to put to destroy really, to open the cracks and, uh, and, and, and destroy your sample. So it's two different kinds of, of stuff. Here, so how do you how do you come how do you compare different fibers? So first we study metal fibers. Why? Because they are the most easily to they are the easiest to to provide. There's a lot of different producers there, so you can order different different lengths, different form factor. And the idea is to check what is the influence of the concentration of the different form factor in order to understand how fibers are working. So first we study the impact of the concentration of fiber here. So here I see like our, when you go from 0% of fiber to no fiber, which is a black curve, you see, it goes up to approximately 10 megapascal here, and then it goes down to zero instantly because you have no energy stocking, it just opens the cracks. And then if you go up to 1%, you basically up to double the, the total strength of your matter, which is huge actually. And you have also a lot of different energy here. This is what happens when you play with the concentration. But what happens when you play with the form factor of your fibers? Then you see that uh, here, this is the flexural strength on the left as a function of the concentration of the fiber here. You see that they have different effects. They are not all as efficient, even if it's the same, um, it's the same material for the fiber. Just the form factor is different. It's enough to make a huge difference here. If you use long fibers, they are way more efficient. And I will go short here but we make a study with the University of Strasbourg and what we conclude is that um, all, the all the fiber behave as their form factor and you can rescale all the curve I showed you before. That means to put them on, all, on a single line if you just think about a new concentration which is um, their form factor. So if you rescale the concentration regarding the form factor, actually all the curves are acting the same. Then it can help you to order the correct uh, fibers if you want to use the one which has the most efficient at the lowest concentration. What you can see here as well is that at low concentration, so for phi uh, divided by phi zero around zero one, fibers have basically zero impact. All those metallic fibers, you need to put a minimum in order to get an influence. Otherwise, it's roughly useless. This is something very important to know if you want to uh, reinforce, reinforce your concrete with fibers. So long and thin fibers are the most efficient at the given concentration. And then we are wondering what happened for the rheology. And here you can see it's also, so this is a curve, shear stress as a function of the shear rate. So it's basically the force to pump the material regarding the speed at which you want to pump. This is very roughly, but I don't have too much time to go into detail of, uh, of rheology. And what you can see is that when you increase the concentration, all the curves are going up. That means that um, they're harder and harder to pump and to cast. This is something that you have to take care of. But what is interesting is that basically it's mainly increased at low yield stress here at the at low speed and not at high speed where you're actually pumping your materials. This is because fibers tend to align with the flow. So actually it's not that hard to pump. This is something that you have to, to also to keep in mind. Most people think it's very hard to pump, but it's not that hard, but it's it has a huge influence here. It's in logarithmic scale. So you have a, a very, very fast factor two here. 
So we'll go a bit faster here. So metal fiber is the strongest, obviously, but they're not very the most suitable for 3D printing. Why? I mean, it's possible here. It's a, it's a picture, so we did it already. So we put some metallic fiber here. I'm not sure you can see, but there's a lot of fibers here. Also, no, uh, you, you see the layer on the outside, but not in the inside, it's pretty homogeneous. But you see concentration is not that high here. Why? It's because they are not flexible enough for the process. There's a lot of pump involving, a lot of mixing process, and it makes it very, very hard to use long, long metallic fibers because they can damage the pieces. It's also very dense. That means that the total weight of your object is also very, very heavy. And it's very expensive too. So, for the, um, so what we decide to do is to look for more suitable fibers, which are fl very flexible to handle the process, which has also low density to not have a very, uh, very heavy concrete, and also a limited impact on the rheology. So what we did basically is to look at polymer fiber, very, very small, very flexible, and also good performance here. So here, this is the result at three days flexion. So what you see, it's like comparing to the reference, the black hair, there is not a huge improvement of the maximum force you need to break your concrete, right? But what you see on the other end, is the energy. You have like this line here, which make it very safe for transport. And it's also like, it's, it's really a lot of resistance for crack openings. If you look only at the energy, so the area below the curve, you see that when you increase the concentration, you have a huge increase of the energy. Also, like more for the business point of view, 1 to 1.5% in mass is very reasonable range for those kind of fibers. It doesn't increase a lot the price of the pieces when compared to normal reinforcements like rebars and stuff. And it's also, once again, very easy to handle for the process. You can add it direct to your mortar or continuously also producing those kind of mortar with fibers, pumping and cast it just afterwards. It's very easy. Um, and on the urology, urology point of view, uh, it's also a huge impact here, but as before, it's mainly an impact on what happened at uh, low shear rate here. So on the yield stress, basically, which is actually good for printing. But when you want to pump, you are roughly at 10 second minus one shear rate. And you see like the difference is way lower here. Obviously, you, do, you don't want to go to this high concentration because it's a huge factor here. But if you compare like red one to the black one, so the reference, for 1% fiber, you only double the pressure needed to pump it. So then you can adapt your pump on your mix design to handle those fibers. So here's what I show here. It's different uh, evolution of the viscosity. Um, another technique, actually, because here what I show you, it was um, the idea to put fibers directly on the mortar you are 3D printing. It's one strategy, and there is another one which is actually very simple which is mainly for safety and transport of the printed pieces. This is simply to, um, to put the fiber in the mortar that you will pour in between printed materials. It's for very specific applications such as panel, for example, or for if you think about also um, some design uh, like furniture, for example, then what you can do is to 3D print with fiber-free printing mortar. The one I showed before, very strong in compression, quite good in flexion, but not good enough for safety. And then what you do is you pour in the middle fiber reinforced self-leveling mortar. So it could be something, so it doesn't increase a lot the price of the pieces, but it improves a lot uh, the safety of it. And here you see, we put approximately uh, 200 kilo above it and it doesn't cracks, even if the layer is only, the thickness is only four centimeters. It can sustain a lot of stress and, uh, and and I guess a picture, it's easy for, for you to, to, see, to see really the impact of it. Um, and another advantage of this technique, which is very specific, is that you can also use very long fibers because you don't have a lot of problem with to have to pump the, project, the product on a very long pipe. You can just mix your fiber reinforced self-leveling mortar and just directly pour it on your pieces. Um, so you can use longer fiber, like 20 millimeters here, and uh, you have a huge impact here. You can uh, go up to double, triple your maximum force and bring a lot of energy. So it's super safe for the transport. It's super good fibers, but obviously those kind of fibers are unfortunately not um, suitable for uh, normal printing because they are too long. And there will be a lot of problem for all the pumps that we have or the mixing process uh, inside. But for those kind of application, it's good. Um, so it's um, a bit what I wanted to discuss with you today. So those two strategies that we're uh, discussing today, which are maybe not uh, as uh, crazy as my colleague before, but a bit more down to earth and also 
as a company, we have to think about the price effect, right? And um, that's the idea to keep the price and the freedom of shape. This is some example of a printing element we did uh, in Sika. Um, so you have this freedom of shape with 3D, and I think it's a main force and the main drive of 3D printing. And we think it's very important to keep it. And with those two techniques here, it doesn't really, it doesn't really change it. You have this very nice design possible. You don't have to make a lot of work after printing, and you can also safely transport your PCs to your clients. Um, so thank you very much for your for your attention. All right, thank you. Uh, I see a question. Uh, any issue with interlayer strength, as uh, as was presented pre in previous previous present presenters? Uh, no, no. So far, not so much. Um, this is what I wanted also to to show you. Like, uh, it's because it's very easy to say that you don't have prime with uh, with interlayer strengths and stuff. That's why I wanted to show you this picture of our uh, very strong colleague, like breaking this color that we printed. Uh, it's because you see that what it cracks, if there is like weak interlayer, it would break in between the layers. I mean, this is something that you can see if you experiment it. But if you control really well, I think it's a question of, um, of how you handle your product, if you control the setting, if you control the rheology, to be sure that your layer before is not too hard uh, already, then you can have weak, weak, weak interlayer uh, interaction. But here you see, when we try to break our pieces, it breaks totally randomly. Um, that's a good sign. Uh, also, I show you another picture with fiber inside. You see, uh, you see the layer at the outside, but when you cut inside, you don't see anything. It's ultra homogeneous there, and it's a sign that you you don't have this problem of layer. It's like you see the layer at the outside, but not in the inside. The inside is super. Con you have a continuous materials basically, and this is what is super important because obviously, if you have problem of layers, then it will make your material super weak especially for transport. Transport could be a big problem. And it would be the same for the second technique when I show that you can pour concrete, uh, fiber reinforced concrete into two, two, two thin wall. If you have any problem of layer because the pressure, it will open. If you just wide open, right? So, um, so far, at least for us, we didn't experience uh, this problem of uh, in-between layer. I think it's a question of controlling uh, kinetics, mainly of your concrete and, and its geology, how you put the layer on top of the layer. It has to be hard, obviously, to sustain the weight, but not too hard, otherwise you don't have too much. Uh, um, it doesn't basically glue to the one before, if I, if I can say this. Uh, thank you. Uh, then there's several, uh, there's, so there's a question, uh, Uh, does the does the addition of colors or fibers in the paste create any printing, uh, i.e. nozzle issues or rheology? Uh, are shorter fibers easier to use? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I mean, for color, actually, not so much. Depending on how, how much color you put inside, obviously, because most are like small particles, so it will it will increase your viscosity. Uh, but if you don't put like, I mean, it's like below 1%, right, what you're putting inside. I mean, depending how bright you want, but you may have to 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 play a bit with your mix design to to have this. If you want to have exactly the same viscosity, you will have, obviously, to play with your mix design, but it's very small fluctuation. As for fibers, as I showed you before, it's very depending on the concentration of the fiber you are using, but also at the kind of fiber you are using. Uh, some fibers influence a lot uh, viscosity and make your Mortar basically not pumpable at all. Uh, if you look, if you use too long fibers, what can happen is that you can have clogging at the end. That's why I say that for uh, for our application, at least for our system, because it's also very system dependent, right? Uh, we 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 say that it's better to use like not too long fibers because then you will have you will avoid way way more the problem of of, uh, of clogging of the nozzle. And um, and also like if you if you you have but you have to control your energy. Everything you will add to your mortar to your concrete will in, in increase its viscosity. But in the case of fibers, it's pretty lucky because when you pump your your mortar, it will align those fibers and reduce the impact. It's a bit I, I went a bit fast there, but it's it's those rheology curves that I show you, where most of the impact of the fibers take place at low speed, at low shear rate, which is a yield stress. When when you don't mix your material, when you don't pump it, 
because the fibers are randomly distributed here and it has a huge impact. But when you pump, when you cast, when actually when you apply the material after the nozzle, fibers are aligned and they are they, they have a less they have a lower impact on the on the rheology, even if it's strong. But you still need to either adapt your material if you want to have exactly the same viscosity, or at the minimum to to be aware that it will increase your the pressure you need to pump your material. So you have to be really sure that your pump can handle it. It's possible to make simulation of it, but it's also something that has to be taken care. It's what I showed there. It's really influenced the rheology. You can like easily double, triple the pressure needed to pump your mortar if you go to too high concentration and not the, or not the correct fibers. So you have to really to pick the good one in order to do that. But obviously it will change, yes. Okay. 